Genovators, it's me Jordan here and welcome back to my YouTube channel. Now Genovators, welcome to my Wonder Woman 1984 spoiler review. Uh, now I previously did a spoiler free review on this channel, which you can check out by clicking that button up there. Uh, but And I asked if you guys wanted me to do a spoiler review in that video and a lot of you guys replied saying yes you would like me to do a spoiler review. So here it is for you today. So rather than in the previous video where I just talked about like the movie in general, like uh, the cinematography or like the writing or just, just in general, this video will be talking about the specific things within the movie, the specific storylines, specific scenes, stuff like that. That. So rather than in my typical movie review formats where I break it down into the good stuff, the mixed stuff and the bad stuff about the movie, this video is going to be breaking it down scene by scene, well not scene by scene but like just it'll be breaking it down in how the events occur in the movie. Uh, so yeah obviously there's a spoiler review so if you don't want to be spoiled then I recommend going to watch the movie and coming back uh, but if you don't really care about spoilers or if you've already seen the movie then this is the video for you. So then without further ado this is my Wonder Woman 1984 spoiler review. Here we go. Alright, so as I said before, we're going to go in the order of which the events occur in the movie. Uh, so let's begin this review off by talking about the opening scene at the Themyscira Olympics. Uh, it was a really cool scene with some great visuals. Now, while I think this scene was pretty pointless, other than the lesson of which Queen Apollo, I think her name is, uh, teaches Diana about, you know, cheating is not the right thing to do, uh, which I'll talk more about later on in this uh, review. It was still a really fun scene regardless, and with great action and great cinematography. Like, the direction and, like, the stunts and all this sort of stuff in the scene is absolutely amazing. Uh, and the young actress, Lily, who plays Diana, uh, who I just found out the other day, that she actually did all her stunts herself in this movie. Like, no stunt doubles were required with her, which is absolutely amazing. And she was just really great in this scene, especially when, you know, she gets pushed off the horse. And Queen Apollo says to her, you know, uh, you shouldn't cheat, but she's like, I should have won that. Yeah, I think she was great in this scene. Now, speaking of this message, now, while in this scene, it is literally spelled out to you that cheating is wrong, the message of nothing good is born on lies comes back later on in this movie, when Diana is convincing everybody to pronounce their wish. Uh, now, while little, this gives the scene some meaning, which I liked, uh, and I look forward to seeing the Amazon spin-offs purely set in Themyscira. I hope we get more of these sort of, like, fun little adventures that they're going together or stuff like that, and just shows you more of, like, the life in Themyscira, if that makes sense. And, you know, I'm looking forward to that spin-off. We then cut to the 1980s, where we get this, like, very cheesy, yet, you know, cool montage of Diana saving people and stopping these criminals, and while there are some terrible CGI wire work, and while I said it was quite cheesy. It was a great scene which helped to establish the 1980s settings within the movie, which later on in the movie didn't really play that big of a role, uh, but it was a great scene just to establish, you know, where it's set in the movie. Uh, and we also see Diana throw her tiara, I think it is called, at the security cameras, uh, therefore, like, providing how she's, like, trying to stay in the dark like Batman, rather than, like, an open superhero that everyone knows, like, Superman. However, this scene also allows for some inconsistencies in regards to the Snyderverse, uh, because she states in Justice League or Batman vs Superman, one of the two, that she turned away from mankind like a hundred years ago, or something like that. Uh, but she's seen trying to help people in this scene, so it doesn't really make sense unless she means like she's trying to like stay undercover in public. If that makes sense, I don't really know. But if they mean like fully, just like not helping mankind, but that's inconsistent because in the scene it's clearly shown that she's helping people. If that makes sense. Uh, <laughs> But, you know, I guess Warner Brothers is just trying to loosely wreck on the Snyderverse, so, yeah, I don't know, really. Uh, it's not, like, a major problem. It's not like, oh, my gosh, this shows a major inconsistency. This whole movie's not canon anymore. It's just something worth noting. In my opinion, the opening 30 minutes of this movie is the best part of the movie, and it was just a fun time at the cinemas, uh, whereas the final two hours dragged on a lot, and, you know, it just lost me due to inconsistencies, terrible pacing, uh, a lot of, like, logistical issues in regards to, like, story writing, stuff like that, which I'll elaborate on later on. But, yeah, the opening 30 minutes was absolutely amazing. We then cut to Diana still grieving the loss of uh, Steve Trevor 70 years later, which is a long time considering they only knew each other for a few days and she's still thinking about him 70 years later. But, you know, plot reasons, it has to happen this way. Uh, we see her sitting by herself at a restaurant and, you know, looking up at her plane, signifying obviously that's how Steve died. And, you know, she's thinking about him, which I really liked the metaphor of, like, seeing the plane uh, flying past. But as I said, it's 70 years after the death. So, like, <laughs> I don't know if that's actually realistic. But, you know, who knows? Maybe it just feels like yesterday I'd her. Who knows? We then cut to Barbara clumsily, like, stumbling into work and meeting Diana. And we see some very in-your-face foreshadowing of the cheetah shoes that uh, Diana's wearing. Uh, now, I said the 
this in the spoiler review, but I really love the development Barbara gets in this movie. Now, other than the cheater part at the end of the movie, the one thing I didn't like about this character development is that she's pinned as the very stereotypical, you know, like, nerd and, like, she's got glasses and no one likes her, no one talks to her. Like, it's a very stereotypical depiction of, you know, a person that's not popular. I mean, I did like the, uh, the character growth from not becoming popular to feeling, you know, very, like, free and stuff like that. However, I did not really like how the lack of popularity was represented within the movie. It was very stereotypical, in my opinion. And as I said before, like, while her transition into Cheetah didn't really make sense, and I'll discuss more of this later on, the evolution from styling is a very awkward, yet stereotypical, clumsy woman just trying to fit in with work and everything, and just trying to make friends and stuff like that. And then later on, you know, getting a hold of the Dreamstone, and then she wishes to become more like Diana and get the powers of her, but in doing so, losing her humanity, and then she becomes an apex predator. And I thought that that was very well handled, in my opinion, other than the transition into Cheetah, and the stereotypical depiction of a nerdy girl. And I absolutely loved Kristen Wiig as Barbara. I thought she was a great casting, in my opinion. She just pulled this off very, very well. Like, she can do a very, you know, aggressive... She can play that villain character very, very well. But she can also play this very, you know, charismatic, like, lively human. And I thought she was just absolutely great in this movie. Now, we didn't say this earlier on, but obviously they found this, uh, like, Dreamstone, which is used as the MacGuffin throughout the entire movie. The FBI gives it to the museum to research, uh, and then both Diana and Barbara get their hands on it. We get to see Diana wish for Steve to return, although it was in her head, which, while it allows for, you know, an even bigger surprise when he does return, but for the general audience, it makes you even more confused, because, you know, we never actually see her making the wish. And they also like the use of, like, the guy wishing for coffee and then instantly getting in this scene. I thought that was a great representation of how this stone works uh, in this movie. Now, I'm not sure if this happens now or later on in the movie, uh, but we see this man harass Barbara, and then later on we see Barbara finally hit back and the sidewalk and beat him up, throw him against the truck, which, showing the loss of her humanity, and then uh, the homeless guy was like, you know, what are you doing? She's like, just mind your own business. That just really shows, you know, she cared for this man before, and now all of a sudden she's like, just like, completely ignoring her because she's losing her humanity, which I thought was a great scene and was one of, if not my favourite scenes in the movie, and has just brilliant scoring behind him. He's just absolutely amazing. I love his scoring in this movie. It's one of his best work in my opinion. We then get introduced to Maxwell Lord who once again while his character is very very flawed and more on this later the actor Pedro Pascal is just did a phenomenal job in this movie. He just didn't hold back at all and just like full on let loose uh, and he just went all in and it really paid off because he was amazing. Now before I move on I just wanted to say this life is good but it can be better. Okay <laughs> moving on. <laughs> We then see Barbara make her wish to become more like uh, Diana. We then see a very cute interaction with him and his son, which was very cute. I absolutely love their dynamic throughout this entire movie. And I just love that it was his son which kept Maxwell's humanity in check. And you could tell that he really cared about his son. Uh, now, I thought both actors in these scenes together throughout the entire movie were really great. We also get to see Simon Stagg appear as a little Easter egg to DC Comics and readers and stuff like that. And so I wonder if we'll actually get to see like a Simon Stagg HBO Max TV series or a movie. I don't know if we ever actually going to see him appear as Metamorphos in the DCEU going forward. Uh, but, you know, perhaps a little bit younger. I'm not so sure. But, you know, it'd be interesting to see him as, you know, Metamorphos in the DCEU. An article just came out the other day from the New York Times about how Warner Brothers is considering a spin-off to every single one of their movies going forward. And so I wonder if Metamorphos might be one of them. We'll just have to wait and see. Uh, who knows? but like it's, it was a great easter egg regardless. Maxwell Lord then visits Barbara at work again and invites both her and Diana to this party uh, which is where Diana and Steve reunite which is a great scene and also this shows the transition between uh, you know Diana being like a very awkward girl and also becoming more popular uh, with that catwalk and like them splitting like the Red Sea to make room for her that was really cool. We then see Steve and Diana discussing his return and then Diana takes him around Washington to show you what the 80s were like I love that in the first movie, Diana was like a fish out of water. You know, she was coming from this isolated island, and then she moved into England, and then he was showing her around as to how everything works. And now, because he came from the 1910s, whatever they are called, you know, he's in the 1980s, so she's showing him around, so it was a nice little swap compared to what happened in the previous movie. And then Steve takes Diana back to the guy's body, of which Steve took over uh, his apartment. Now, this leads me into a perfect segue in discussing Steve Trevor's return in this movie. So, upon first watch, I came out of the movie going... I don't see why people have a problem with this. Like, he returns in a way which serves the narrative. Alas, with some consequences of Diana using the Dreamstone. And then, alas, with some great emotional payoff once she renounces her wish. And some great acting between the two. Great chemistry. I love seeing Chris Pine back. I said this all in my previous review. However, mind you, my opinion on this is a little bit, like, swayed by the internet. Actually, quite swayed by the internet. I, wouldn't, I never would have thought this had not, you know, seen the internet. But I think it's worth noting anyway. The more I think about it, the more it is morally incorrect. 
Now, while I have no problem with him returning via the stone, like, at all, like, the stone makes perfect sense, like, you know, I don't know how else he's going to come back 70 years later. But what I do have a problem with, you know, is that he should have come back as Steve, not just, like, taken over some poor guy's body. Like, the fact that he takes over the body of a poor guy, uh, takes over his apartment, and most likely made out with Diana without his consent, is extremely morally incorrect. Like, think about his family, think about everyone that, you know, like, he didn't even give consent to this happening, like, he didn't even question it, like, it's really, really wrong. And as I said, they literally just didn't hesitate at all, which is really wrong, considering she's Wonder Woman. Now, while I understand how it ties into the final scene where Diana actually meets the guy behind the body, uh, that doesn't justify how wrong it was in the movie prior. Now, I read this thread that uh, Patty Jenkins retweeted. They highlighted, like, they condemned this behavior by showing how the soul stone is, like, the god of lies or something like that. Now, I see where you're coming from. Like, they never officially said that this is all fine. However, it's the lack of actually addressing the problem head on, which I have a problem with. Like, if they just said, you know, we can't help what happened. Let's just try and find a way to get you back. Like, I understand that. Like, they, obviously, they have no choice in this. But the fact that it happened and they didn't question it is wrong, in my opinion, at least. If he just came back as Steve and not in somebody else's body, I would have had no problem with his return whatsoever. I love seeing Chris Pine back. It was just such a strange creative decision. Like, one scene for, like, a whole movie's worth of a storyline. It just doesn't make sense. Why did you choose this? Like, I don't really understand that. Uh, and even in the context of this movie, why would he even take over somebody's body? And why this person in particular? Like, it was just never explained well, in my opinion. That's just one of the many things that are very flawed in this movie in regards to logic and just explaining stuff. Like, what? Uh, so that's my rant over for Steve Trevor. <laughs> Cut back to Maxwell Lord. We see Maxwell wish to become the stone in his office and more on this later And then we see Diana and Steve go to an air museum hijack a plane turn it invisible and fly through fireworks now Rent time again now, while there are many logical problems with this scene, such as, you know, how come nobody sees them until they're on the runway? You know, how does someone from the 1910s suddenly know how to fly? A 1980s plane instantly. How come Diana instantly knows how to make a plane go invisible when she'd only tested on a cut prior and there are literally no other references to her being able to do this early on? And why is there a fully functional war jet in an air museum anyway? How is it possible to fly through fireworks? A lot of problems with this scene. <laughs> I did like the fan service of which the scene had and that it paid off what everybody had been hoping like the Linda Carter series and like all these other series you've seen like an invisible jet and a lot of people have been wanting it and so it just paid off in this moment you know she finally got it however it doesn't necessarily mean anything in the long run and therefore could have been cut out or just trimmed at least or just edited to make it make sense but you know it was still a reasonably fun scene and very visually pleasing especially on a big screen i said this in the last review i literally pity that you guys had to watch this on hbo max because it was just such a breathtaking experience in cinemas i think it was this scene where i felt my chair vibrating it was so good uh now obviously they're flying over to egypt to meet maxwell lord there because he's apparently doing business deals uh, with people over there so maxwell lord goes over to egypt and wreaks havoc uh there by returning the land back to the leader but taking his security from him uh in return now minus the one action scene where they're running down the highway uh which i'll get to soon this storyline was incredibly dull and was completely unnecessary and could have just been cut in my opinion now i tried to explain this but failed miserably in the spoiler free review there was also a large portion of max's story arc which didn't really need to happen in my opinion i feel like the last half an hour or whatever would have made up for that half an hour miss of you know his storyline or whatever in the middle it's really hard to speak about this without spoiling it but if you've seen it and you get what i mean what happens in the final battle could have summarized what happens up throughout the entire movie if that makes sense so now i can actually explain to you what i was trying to say without you know worrying about spoilers so what i was trying to say was this instead of this entire storyline in the middle east the repercussions of the world getting the wishes granted by maxwell lord could have easily been shown in a montage you know at the end in the final battle where he you know he has his broadcast and stuff like that to the entire world there was no need for like an entire like half an hour long i think it is i don't know just a very very long boring storyline just for one wish like the ending shows many different consequences for you know broadcasting and saying what do you wish for such as you know obviously the person dropping dead in the cafe becoming famous or whatever and then you know the terrorists wishing for more nukes and then the rush versus america war there were all these different storylines but you didn't need a half an hour storyline just for these few little wishes and stuff like that you could have easily summarized it all at the end so why why was it necessary other than she he gets oil like we didn't need this storyline whatsoever and that could have cut an easy 20 30 minutes from this movie it was completely unnecessary in my opinion 
However, as I said, the action scene was quite good, which was one of the only few in the movie. I saw this compilation on YouTube and it was literally under five minutes out of a two and a half hour movie. Five minutes is action in a superhero movie. So if that doesn't really say much about this movie, I don't know what will. <laughs> and I did like seeing Wonder Woman losing her powers, which as I said before, really showed the implications and repercussions and impact of the wish to get Steve back and it was overall a great action scene. It really helped to break up the pacing. However, uh, the practical stunts and green screen work in this scene in particular was abysmal. And I spoke about that in more depth in the spoiler-free review, so you can go check that out to hear more about my thoughts about the CGI and practical work. It was just... I don't know who approved on that because it was terrible. <laughs> We then see Maxwell Lord Grant wishes to several of his colleagues at work, which is an okay scene. It was actually quite funny. I mean, it was an okay scene, but at least it made sense. Uh, <laughs> he then goes to the White House uh, and he meets with the president. Uh, now, this was a scene that really made this movie so much more confusing than it needed to be, in my opinion. Like I said, established earlier one in this movie, in order for the stone to grant you your wish, you must be touching the stone. By coming up with such a lazy excuse to the scene that Max can metaphorically and literally touch you with the particles touching your phone and then into the camera or something like that, something particles, it just made up this lazy excuse. It was an incredibly illogical and just such a lazy excuse, just to cover up with some very lazy plot convenience in my opinion. This storyline could have absolutely easily just worked better in a modern day setting as technology plays an even larger role nowadays than it did back then. Now this is what I was saying in this spoiler free review that in all in order for this movie to be larger in scale and global impact, this movie is really inconsistent in regards to its own rules established earlier on in the film and it allows for some logic and consistency to just be thrown out of the window, coming up with such lazy excuses to cover up with those mistakes. So I, in my opinion at least, I didn't understand much from this storyline, I thought it was just so lazy. Uh, so they could have easily come up with some better way to have a bigger global impact. Maybe they didn't even need a global impact, maybe they could have made it smaller and they would have made it for a more intimate and better movie, who knows. We then see uh, Diana, you know, try to stop Maxwell Lord in the White House and, you know, it was a really cool action scene with the last and stuff like that. And then when they come so close, our uh, Barbara knocks over Diana uh, and says, you know, stay away from Max and stuff like that. And we have this whole Diana versus Barbara fight scene. Uh, and I even predicted moments before she appeared that she would come to defend Max and I was correct. It was a little bit predictable. And then we see Steve, you know, grab Maxwell Lord against the pole. And in this scene, he could have easily just wished for, you know, everything to return back to normal. But then it would have come with some consequences, that's true. But also, it would have just everything would just go back to normal uh so you know plot convenience i guess the fight scene was actually quite good in my opinion and at least had some better practical effects in cgi than the last battle in the middle east we then see all this havoc and like chaos down uh, one of the washington dc streets and then diana and steve have a rather emotional uh, scene with great acting from both gal Gadot and chris pine where they have to say goodbye to each other in order for diana to regain her powers to full strength now while it was quite emotional uh the scene is basically a rehash of the ending of the first wonder woman movie where you know they have an emotional farewell and then steve goes and kills himself and then diana uses his rage and grief in order to grow more power to defeat the villains uh however i did like it carried some weight to the scene and it showed some significant consequences to using the stone which I spoke about earlier in regards to having goodbye to Steve and Diana losing her powers it was still a great scene regardless now speaking of this grief Diana then uses his rage to discover a new ability flight we have quite a long scene where Diana learns to fly and even rides lighting which I don't really have a problem with because it's a superhero movie which once again allow for some great fan service to be given uh, you know, people have been wanting her to fly for a while. And now, however, it was a rather long scene. Uh, and, you know, the green screen work was absolutely terrible. It was so distracting in this scene. And it completely killed the scene for me. It took me completely out of it. However, it was a great climactic moment in the movie. And it was a great moment where you get the sense of realisation that Wonder Woman is now back. Like, she's got her powers back and she can finally defeat the villains. She didn't even need this power, but more than that later. <laughs> We then see Barbara jump on Max's helicopter, and as I was saying before in regards to like the rules established earlier on in the movie, you can only make one wish, and Barbara had already made hers to become more like Diana. Now in this scene, they come up with such a lazy excuse that wasn't explained well at all, as to, you know, Max is feeling generous and gives Barbara the powers of a cheater, which either makes no sense whatsoever or was extremely poorly explained. It was such a lazy excuse as to how she gets her powers as Cheetah. And we don't even know, rather than her stating that she wants to become an Apex Predator, why she becomes a Cheetah in particular. Like, there are so many Apex Predators, and, you know, Cheetah's not even the number one. So, wh why a Cheetah? Why even an Apex Predator in the first place? Like, this absolutely makes no sense whatsoever. Why, why did she become a whale? <laughs> now, there was obviously a lot of foreshadowing earlier on in the movie, uh, you know, but that doesn't, still doesn't explain why it happened the way it did. Just that, you know, it was coming. 
So was it in return for one of the wishes that, you know, Max Grant, but then it wouldn't be better fitting him, would it? And where, where's the, the cheetah skin coming from? What? What? Makes no sense. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> we then see Max's plan fully realised, uh, you know, with his speech as president becoming televised on screens all around the world. Now, this also doesn't really make sense in regards to the rule established earlier on in the movie, that you have to physically touch them, and that whole lazy particles excuse, which I talked about earlier on. But also, since when did Max become a telepath? Like, how could he hear people through a screen? Is it the particles coming at the screen and the particles bounce off the camera into his... How did he hear 7 billion people at once? How did... What? 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 I... <laughs> That's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> Seriously, like, how did he hear and grant millions, if not billions of wishes all at one stage? It just does not make any sense. As I said in the last video, I know it's a superhero movie, so that in amongst itself allows for some suspension of disbelief, uh, but even in the context of the superhero world, like this world in particular, the movie still didn't make any sense. And there were a lot of scenes where we couldn't actually try to understand how things were happening, and we were just forced to go with it, otherwise we'd just be left behind. Like, we just have to jump over all these hurdles, like, just ignore that logic exists. <laughs> and this whole scene and this whole evil plot is just a perfect example of that. Now, I understand what I was going for, was not well executed at all, in my opinion. We then see Diana show up in this armour, and Cheetah appears, and they fight together, uh, which was explained earlier on in the movie, where Steve and Diana were in this apartment, looking at TV screens, even though she said that she didn't have any TV screens earlier on in the movie, therefore another inconsistency, but at least mine at this time. Uh, and in that same scene, we've got like a backstory as to, you know, the golden armour, which was never explained as to how she got from Themyscira or why, which was another nitpick. And then as I said, you know, Cheetah and Diana fought together, and we also don't get an explanation as to why she wears the armour. Just a lot of moments where we have to just go with it. And another complaint in this scene, the strongest piece of armour in Themyscira with all the Amazonians' armour put together for one warrior to fight against the entire world to defend their entire village, and a Cheetah cuts through it. What? <laughs> like, even with Wonder Woman at full power? What? <laughs> I highly doubt that. And, you know, the CGI on Cheetah was actually half decent. However, obviously, the dark lighting, uh, you know, was trying to, like, cover up, you know, the bad CGI by doing that. Uh, we couldn't really see anything because it was so dark. <laughs> and then we see Cheetah get struck with lightning and get defeated, even though she asked for the strength of Diana and, therefore, the same godlike powers. And, you know, Max even supposedly granted her more powers. Or did that replace the powers that she had previously when she asked for Diana? Or did they add together? That doesn't really make sense. If it's the latter, where it's as well as Diana's powers, she can, therefore, harness and even ride lightning. And so so one simple bolt of lightning shouldn't have done much to her, therefore another plot hole. I also just wish we saw more of her as Cheetah because they just teased her, you know, in the trailers and the posters and everything, like, Cheetah's the main villain. And then we see one fight scene with her, which is <laughs> a big disappointment at this movie. We just had one fight scene at the end. Hopefully in the third movie we'll see more of her, uh, which was just confirmed to be in development the other day. But obviously she'll be much older by the time, it's because it's set in the modern day, so she'll be like much older. But we'll have to wait and see, I guess. Additionally, this movie didn't necessarily show how the cheetah would turn back into Barbara. Like, if she revoked her second wish, if it was a second wish, even though technically it wasn't a wish, then she can't return as Barbara. But if she can change between forms like she can in the comics, then... Look, as I was saying in the spoiler-free review, the ending just doesn't really make any sense and tie up any loose endings whatsoever. And so when I was on, like, the edge of my seat waiting to see, you know, how it would all conclude, I was really disappointed both times watching it. We then cut to Diana and Max fight for the last time, and I was also not happy as to how this plot concluded. Uh, look, once Diana knocks the camera over, she ties her rope to Max's leg, even though I thought she couldn't do that earlier on, even though there was just wind there. Like, why can't the last two go through wind? <sighs> anyway, so yeah, she ties it to Max's leg and gives this whole sappy speech to the entire world about, you know, the truth always prevails over lies. Now, look, I 100% get what the movie was going for. It was trying to send a good message, especially given the circumstances the world is in right now. It was just trying to be a positive message and, you know, try to bring some optimism to the world. But going back to the suspension of disbelief, are we seriously expected to believe that 7 billion people, well, at least that's if everyone made a wish, including, like, even terrorists with nuclear weapons, like, people wishing for their, like, family to not have cancer anymore, or just, like, really young kids, like, wishing to get, like, the biggest dream. Are we really supposed to believe that all these people understand or would even dare to revoke their wishes? Now, I know I'm not the only person saying this, but, like, I've seen it everywhere online, and this was immediately my first thought, too. Like, are we really supposed to believe that? Like, it was just so unrealistic. Like, the ending could have been handled 
made it much better in my opinion. And we see an orange glow through the screens, but what does that last you actually do? Does it allow everybody to see the truth or is that just how Diana communicated with everyone? How was that even possible when the cameras were destroyed? How is she still talking to the world? Is she a telepath too like Maxwell Lord Summer Hayes? Getting 7 billion people to talk to him via wishes even though- I don't know what's going on. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what happened. <laughs> Now, I know Diana said earlier on that you can see the truth, but it was never actually explained in this scene if the last you had that same purpose. However, I did like that Max showed his human side, but when it came to his son, and the son was the person that, you know, convinced him to revoke his wish. And then the scene where he reunited with his son was really, really cute. I mean, he just came out of absolutely nowhere, was in this highway, and then all of a sudden just pops up at this bush. How did he know the back was appearing there? Who knows? Uh, but I do like that scene regardless. Uh, it was really, really cute. However, his character was also left open-ended. Like, this was the last time that we could see him, which is on the side of the street or whatever. And how did he get back to that place if he's no longer the president? Who knows? Now, I wonder if he's going to come back in the third movie. Uh, however, he'd be like 80 years old because it's set in the present. But it's unlikely, but very, very possible as well. And then, of course, we get the final nice ending scene, which was fitting considering it was released on Christmas Day, which is where Diana is just celebrating Christmas with her neighbourhood. This is where Diana finally meets the man of which the body Steve was in uh, throughout the entire movie, which, as I said before, I get the point of bringing him back for this one scene, but throughout the entire movie, was it really necessary or could he have just been in his own body the entire movie? <laughs> I still didn't like the execution of the entire storyline. And then, of course, we get the amazing mid credit scene where Linda Carter returns, uh, this time playing uh, Asteria, the person they described, you know, as the person with the golden armor earlier on in the movie, uh, rather than Wonder Woman this time. Now, it was cheesy with that wing to the camera, but I didn't really have a problem with that because it was still a fun scene regardless, and I love seeing this cameo from her. Now, I knew it was coming because a lot of people were saying that she was going to have a cameo, but I actually thought it was earlier on in the movie when she was running through the neighborhood. <laughs> I thought that was her. Uh <laughs> Now, I wonder what this means in regards to the next movie and whether or not she'll have a main role. Uh, who knows? We'll have to wait and see. Uh, we don't really have many details as to what the third movie will be like other than it's set in the present. So we'll have to wait and see, I suppose. So in conclusion, I've clearly stated a lot of problems I have with this movie. I like, didn't like the MacGuffin news. It's like the Wishing Stone. Like, where did it come from? How did Maxwell Lord know about it? Like, how, if it was inconsistent because he had to touch them and the particles excuse it. I thought Barbara already made a first wish. A lot of problems with that. A lot of problems. And the negative does outweigh the good in my opinion. Opinion. the pacing's off, the action's terrible, okay, a lot of that sort of stuff. However, this does not necessarily make it a bad movie. A poorly paced and not well explained at all movie, yes, very much so, it is that. However, it's not bad. Like, the fact that I've already seen it again in cinemas says something. Like, if you're willing to just forget all that logic and all this sort of stuff, it's still an enjoyable movie regardless. I mean, there are a lot of times where it can be boring. In fact, the whole storyline is really, really boring because of the pacing and stuff like that. But, you know, I wouldn't discourage you from watching it either. Like, as I said before, most for the review, it's definitely not better than the first. It's still decent overall. It's it's kind of incomparable to the first movie because like, this was a very cheesy, like, modern superhero film. Or modern in the sense that, you know, it's just a superhero versus a bad guy. And it's set in the 80s but not like a war film back in the original movie but set in the 1910s so it's completely different and also as hip saying if you want to see my overall thoughts on the movie like the technical aspects of the film rather than the specific story details or if you just want to see what my thoughts are without spoiling stuff you can go check out my spoiler free review which i'll leave linked down below and i was already up in the button up there like i discussed stuff like the uh story the cast the green screen like the general mcguffin all that sort of stuff in that review so i definitely recommend checking it out while i understood it a little bit more the second time around the fact that you have to see it twice for it to make sense just shows the flaws about this movie but i wouldn't discourage you from watching it as i said before i'd recommend watching it if you want a fun night out or at least if you're curious as to what the movie is like go and see this movie but just don't feel in the rush to see it like it's just just take your time watching it <laughs> so as i gave it in the first movie i'm going to give it a 7 out of 10 in this review and yeah that is my spoiler review thank you guys so much for watching this video i really hope you guys enjoyed it quite a long one today but yeah thank you guys so much and please be sure to like subscribe and turn on the post notifications so you guys know when i upload my video and this was the first official video of 2021 obviously i had my uh, last two videos which is like my rewind video and like the uh new year's eve vlog which is kind of like a transition between two years but this is my first official video uh for the year I've got a packed schedule of all these uh, videos coming out soon, such as, as I said, in the last video. Uh, we've got, like, ranking all 2020 movies I saw in a few days, ranking all DCU movies, uh, more episodes of, like, Jordan's Weekly Breakdown, uh, Among Us, my Discord server, all these videos. So please be sure to subscribe and turn on post notifications so you are updated as to when these videos come out. Yeah, so that is all I have for you guys today. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. I really hope you enjoyed it. And please just do whatever you can to get life back to normal. Just do all the right things. Protect yourself. Protect your family. And I will see you guys in my next video. Thank you guys so much for watching. And I will see you next time. My name is Jordan. And I am out. Bye.